why do the earliest manuscripts not have this? Well, the, the fact is, uh, we don't really know, but what you do with a passage like this, and there's not many, um, I think there's one other in, in, you know, in the New Testament where it says, uh, this is not in the earliest passages, but you check it against other scripture. You make sure that it lines up and, and, it, and it's true to other scriptures. So we're going to be doing that as we look through John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, this is a powerful chapter because it reveals, it's got one of the I am statements of Jesus, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And we see Jesus as the light. He's coming into the world to, to bring light into our dark world. And as the light and as the truth, Jesus is the one who can bring grace and forgiveness to all of us who need it, all of us who have sinned and fall, fallen short of God's standard, his glory, uh, we, when we come to him in repentance, he offers us grace and forgiveness. And uh, so let's get into verse one. It says this, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Here we see the, the secret to the peace of Jesus. And, and to the, way, the, the reason he, he was able to have peace, he was able to have calm in his life, because he got alone with God. Regularly, it says that he regularly <clears throat> went to the Mount of Olives to be alone with God. He, um, we see Jesus, first we see his devotion where he went to the Mount of Olives at dawn. And then we see that this was one of his favorite spots, the Mount of Olives. It was a place where he could be alone with God. He could be alone with uh, his group, his disciples, right? It was a place of quietness and just a retreat where he met God face to face and he was strengthened for his life and his ministry. He was encouraged. So we see three things. We see his devotion. We see that he was worshiping. He went to the temple courts. He, uh, we see his mission, his, his purpose as, as he was teaching and discipling. It says all the people gathered around him and he sat down and he taught them. So we see really the focus of Jesus' life in devotion to God, commitment and regular, just getting away daily, worship and his mission and his teaching and all this. We see Jesus. Uh, he started teaching early in the morning and it says he, he came and he taught. And, and these words in the, in the original Greek language, it's like this continuous action that the people continued coming. He continued teaching them. And uh, his, his very mission was worshiping God, teaching and ministering to people. Of course, his ultimate mission was to give his life on the cross and to rise again. But we see how he spent the, the moments of his life worshiping God and raising up others, reaching out to others. And he showed us in this how we should walk through life, uh, a life of worship and, and a life of of growth spiritually, that we're able to pass on what we're learning, serving and ministering to people. All right, so now we're going to get into this, this uh, passage, this story of this woman who was caught in the act. Let's look at verse 3. Uh, it says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin... Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I wonder, have you ever been caught doing something dumb? I mean, (laughs) we all do dumb things at times, and we wish we could reverse time. We wish we could go back. And whenever, you know, whenever I get caught doing something stupid, my first reaction is sort of just freeze, you know, to to uh, panic, to get the the O face. Did did I do that? Um, <laughs> and uh, my natural tendency is to freeze when I get caught. And so this woman, she gets caught, if you can imagine, in the very act of adultery, uh, sex outside of marriage or sex uh, with someone who is married, um, whether it's both parties who are married or one party who, one person who is married, and uh, she is caught. You can imagine how she reacted, you know, uh, stunned, embarrassed, afraid, all of these feelings that she had, and to make it worse, I mean, this was going public instantly. Uh, it would be like today, you know, you, uh, you, whatever you've done being posted instantly on social media, on Facebook, on, on uh, Instagram, and everybody would see and everybody would be talking. And what happens when we're afraid, check this out, fear freezes you. We're frozen by fear. Fear keeps us stuck, and it keeps us from moving forward. And so she was literally brought, if you can imagine, in front of the temple, the place where the people worship, where she worshiped, where, where uh, the place of, of the, the, this presence of God is, as, they, as they understood it. And can you imagine just being brought to church, being exposed and all of your sins exposed, your worst sin. Well, this woman, she's thrown into the middle of a large crowd. They're listening to Jesus teach. And uh, then she's got the, the religious leaders there, those holier-than-thou uh, leaders, supposed leaders, who were, were pointing their fingers. They were accusing her. They were talking about her. And they wanted to stone her. They wanted to see her dead. And they were really, this wasn't about the woman. This was an opportunity for them. This was a trap for Jesus. They had a catch-22 for Jesus. Uh, If Jesus said, oh yeah, that's the law, go ahead and stone her, then all the people he was teaching uh, would would look at him and and say, say, you know, he's not he, he's he's not teaching love. I mean, he's he's condemning this woman, um, and and he would be breaking the Roman law. But if he refused to stone her, if he said don't stone her, then it would it would open him up to the accusation uh, by the the religious leaders that he wasn't taking the law of Moses seriously, the Old Testament law seriously. Now think about this: these leaders, they didn't care at all about this woman. She was a prop. She was collateral damage. They were simply trying to trap Jesus. I mean, if you go to Deuteronomy 22.22, which is where they were getting this, um, you know, this law, it actually says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. So what, what does the Old Testament say? It's saying both parties are responsible. Both are, are involved and have sinned. Both get treated equally. But you see in the first century in Israel that, that they left the man alone. They didn't even deal with him. They brought in the woman and they didn't mention the man. Well, today, look at 
the state of uh, infidelity today, affairs. We call them affairs, you know, because they're, uh, it makes it, it softens it. It's just an affair. Well, no, it's, it's adultery. And the Old Testament certainly takes this very seriously. Jesus takes this very seriously. And, and as we look at this, this is not uh, Jesus saying that's okay. But, um, but, you know, it has become the norm. Divorce has become the norm today in, in our culture. And so uh, how far we have moved as well from God's heart and God's intent for marriage that really is to, um, to picture the picture of marriage. And God is the one who created marriage. And God is the one who gets to define marriage. And it's the picture of a man and a woman in a committed mar- a relationship for life. And it's the picture of the commitment of Jesus to his church, to his people. And he'll never leave his church. He's always faithful to his church. That means we need to be faithful to each other in marriage. And so this woman, she is she is afraid. She is scared. She's facing the firing squad and she's facing the accusations and the charges and the verdicts and the finger and the condemnation, the judgments. All of these uh, feelings that she is going through and uh, when you are in that position of condemnation and fear, you freeze. You freeze. What do I do? What? Where do I go? Um, can you imagine that? And maybe in your life, even today, you recognize some sin in your life that has got you stuck. It's got you frozen. Maybe some accusations are coming against you that have gotten you stuck where you're at because you're afraid. Fear freezes us. It freezes us. It gets us stuck. We can't make progress. We can't um, grow while we're we feel we're being condemned, and uh, I also want to kind of point out this idea that uh, as Christians, there's no place for for virtue signaling as believers. I mean, that's what these religious leaders were doing. They were making her look bad. They love making her look bad and others look bad to build themselves up. It makes them look so holy and so righteous. And sometimes instead of us as believers making sure people know that we're just as messed up as they are, you know, we've got, uh, we fall short. I fall short every day. Um, And so this uh, psychologist named Joshua B. Grubbs, that should be a song, Joshua B. Grubbs, he writes about a recently published study that asked 6,000 Americans questions about their most important moral and political beliefs and how they communicate those beliefs to people around them, mostly probably on social media, right? And almost everyone said they occasionally uh, grandstand. You know, they share their beliefs in order to gain more respect um, or to gain some points, some social points. Um, But this causes conflict in their relationships, they admitted people who said they're virtue signaling. They said they got they have more arguments with their uh, family. They've severed ties with friends or family members over political disagreements, over moral disagreements, um, and people who use their deepest held beliefs to boost their own status in life. They said they have more toxic social media behaviors, including picking fights over politics on Facebook putting down people you don't even know on Twitter for having the wrong opinions, opinions that go against you know, the, the, the main uh, message that is supposed to be accepted out there. And so what this, this um, psychologist says, Grubbs, he says, check your motivation. You know, check it. And here's exactly what he says. He says, when you enter into contentious territory with someone, whose opinion differs, ask whether you're doing it because you're interested in communicating and connecting with them, or are you just trying to score points? Do you find yourself trying to one-up the good deeds of someone else to make yourself look good to people who you're trying to impress? And that's what these religious leaders were doing, and I think that's what so often 
we can be guilty of doing, making ourselves look better at the expense of someone else instead of reaching out to someone and lifting them up and raising them up, recognizing that if it's not for the grace of God, we would be in that same situation. And, um, and you know, with, with the right decisions, any of us could be in that situation. So we're dependent on God's grace. And that's where these religious leaders were missing it. But the second thing, the second big idea here is Jesus frees you. Jesus frees you. Now, there, there is, this is recent news about this high school ethics textbook in China. Um, in communist China, they have put out a new revised version, a whole different version of this passage in John 8, 3 through 11. See, in, in reality, Jesus is presented with this woman who's caught in adultery, and he says, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. But in the communist version, Je here's what Jesus says. He says the law has to be enforced, and he himself, can you imagine this? This is sick. Jesus stones this woman to death in the the version that these high school students in China are presented with. And, and this presents the, the evil teaching that Satan wants our world to buy into, that God is merciless, that he's harsh, that he's cold, that he's judgmental towards sinners who would come to him. And, and that's what the enemy wants us to believe is that, that there's no grace and, and he wants to hide the incredible grace of God that God gives to, to anyone who comes to him in repentance and in faith because he didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to condemn the world for our sin, but he came to, to redeem the world and to remove our sin. And when this woman, uh, they bring this woman to Jesus, Jesus isn't... Uh, repulsed or or uh, disgusted by this woman his heart goes out to this woman he has compassion on her the religious leaders they 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 couldn't stand this woman but Jesus doesn't act that way instead immediately he goes and he starts to write with his finger in the ground on the ground and we try to figure out what is it that Jesus was writing, you know, um, Jesus, why are you writing on the ground, right? Uh, what is it that's so important that you need to make a memo? Um, and he writes on the ground, and uh, then he, he says what he says, and then he writes on the ground again. And so people are saying, what, we try to figure out what was Jesus writing, you know, we want to know, and we're really just guessing. So some people say, well, he was just ignoring them to force them to repeat what they were saying to just expose the evilness in their hearts. Uh, some people say, well, no, he was trying to just calm down, buy time, so he could consider what it was he was going to say, which I'm pretty sure he knew exactly how he's going to respond. You know, But uh, the third idea it would be that he was just overcome by feelings of anger or compassion and uh, so he needed he needs some time to do that, and he's writing. Of course, others and probably one of the most uh, you know used uh, ideas out there is that he started writing the sins of all of those accusers, those religious leaders. I don't believe that's what he was doing because Jesus, you know, as much as he had issues with those religious leaders, he wasn't about um, pointing you know out their sins. That's not, that's, he didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. John 3, 17 says, for God did not come, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But think about where Jesus is writing. He's writing with his finger on the stone foundation of the temple courts. And, and, and you can imagine that, that this is a picture of Jesus and he's saying, look, you're trying to use the, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, against me. Look, I'm the one who wrote the law on the tablets with my finger, not once, but twice. Isn't that incredible to, to, to think about? Listen, we don't always act like forgiven people, but we should. 
we should because none of us has the right to pick up the stone and throw it at someone else. You know, we can't because we have sin in our own lives and and we're so thankful for the for the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. And then the final thing is this, your freedom is free. Your freedom is free. The Bible says that who the son sets free is free indeed. And Jesus is saying, he's not saying, oh, just let her off, you know, let her off the hook. It's not that. He says, I know the rules. I know the law. I know the price for her sin. And I know that there's no one who can keep my perfect standard. And that's why I came into the world. And I know what the punishment for her sin is. And I'm going to personally take the punishment for her sin on myself, on the cross. Jesus is saying a lot of things to this woman in the way he acts, the way he responds. He's saying, I see you, I know you, I love you, I care about you. And really, here's three things, I think, big things he's saying to her. First, he's saying, you're not not alone. You're not the only one who has sinned, who has fallen short. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So when I point my finger at you, I've got three pointing back at me. We all stand in the same need for Jesus. And then he says to her, where where are your accusers? And he says, says, has no one condemned you? No one has condemned you? You're not condemned. (laughs) You know, Jesus uh, alone, he was the only one who was there who could have cast a stone because he was sinless. He had never sinned. He never sinned. So he could cast a stone, and yet he didn't. Um, Romans 8.1 reminds us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So he was saying, you aren't alone. You aren't condemned. But he was saying, you are responsible. You do have a choice to make. He tells her, he tells her, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and sin no more. And Jesus gives her away and gives us away to leave behind that sinful life for a brand new life. Jesus is saying, look, I came to set the captives free. I came to set you free. Jesus didn't just die for you. He died in your place. He died with your sin. And Jesus didn't just come to cancel your debt. He came to fully pay your debt. The debt wasn't just canceled. It was paid in full, so that you can know for sure that when Jesus sets you free, you are really free. You know, after the condemnation and the guilt are gone, now she can walk in freedom. She can walk in in forgiveness and grace. And, and then, as she receives that grace, then she could begin the change that God wanted to make in her life. That gives you real security when you know you're forgiven You know your love that much. Now you can live a new life. Listen, condemnation is going to keep you down. But if you are focused in on God, you're going to get back up again. Even though you've been accused, you've been thrown down, God still has a plan for your life if you look to him. Proverbs 24, 16 says, The godly may trip seven times, but they will get back up again. Okay? Continue to get back back up. No matter how many times you get thrown down, uh, you just got to get up one more time. And and Jesus says, you're set free. And that starts and ends at the cross. Once you realize that there's no more stones of condemnation, and you realize that God isn't mad at you, then you can walk in freedom. Uh, Don't be focused on your sin, especially the sins of your past. Be focused on Jesus and the plan and the purpose he has for your future. Don't be failure focused. Be forgiveness focused. You are living forgiven as a forgiven child of God. And that means that you can now trust in Jesus for the complete forgiveness of your sin. And it starts by talking with him about your sin to really receive the forgiveness that only Jesus can give. So let's pray together right now as we wrap this up. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you in this place, God, that uh, that we recognize that we're all in the same boat. 
that we've all fallen short of your standard. And God, that, that sin is not just messing up. It's not just a mistake, but sin is a sickness. And, and it's, a, it, it's a, an illness that kills God, that destroys our lives. It destroys our relationship with you. God, uh, make us aware and, and sorry, God, that we could receive your forgiveness. Make us more aware of the grace and the forgiveness that comes through Jesus today. God, as you forgive us, as you strengthen us, as you give us that grace that we can pass on to others, that we're not going to be ones to throw stones at others, but we're going to be ones who, who are like Jesus, who offer compassion and point the way to a new life, a free life that's found in you, Jesus. We thank you for that, and I thank you for each person who's listening, God, and each person uh, today. I pray a special blessing on them, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a blessed week. I can't wait to see you really soon, and uh, be sure to share this with your friends and share this on social media and other ways so we can pass the good word along. Thank you so much, and be blessed.